This is the Plan Air Podcast with Eric Rhodes, publisher and founder of Plan Air Magazine. In the Plan Air Podcast, we cover the world of outdoor painting. Called Plan Air, the French coined the term, which means open air or outdoors. The French pronounce it Plan Air. Others say Plain Air. No matter how you say it, there is a huge movement of artists around the world who are going outdoors to paint. And this show is about that movement. Now, here's your host, author, publisher, and painter, Eric Rhodes. Welcome to the Plein Air Podcast, everybody. It's been a while. I, I kind of, it's just been crazy. I've been able to get the podcast done for some reason. I think summer just got in the way. No excuses for not getting it done, but we're back now. We have some incredible interviews scheduled, including a terrific one today with Jill Stephanie Wagner, and you're not going to want to miss her. You probably already know all about her, but if you don't, this is a great opportunity to learn about a premium a plein air painter and a fabulous artist in a lot of ways. So uh, we hope that you will embrace the whole plein air lifestyle. And that's what this program is all about. It has been a really terrific summer. I've been out at our lake home most of the summer in the Adirondacks and have been painting a lot this summer. Couldn't do it last summer because of circumstances. But this summer, uh, for instance, we launched the redesign of plein air magazine. It's took us uh, about, about a year to get that done. I was very excited when I got mine in the mail and uh, it really came out nice. We're really proud of it. If you're not a subscriber, hope you will be. Uh, then in June, uh, my Adirondack Publishers Invitational event uh, with about a hundred artists, we had a really terrific time. Uh, there we are around a campfire. Oops, I'm not supposed to do that. And then, uh, so we, but we, you know, we had campfires, we painted outdoors, we put all of our paintings out uh, every night, uh, we sat around and sang. We had a lot of guitarists this year, and um, we just had a great time. It's a lot of fun to, just to get together in, in a community of artists and paint. It's, uh, sometimes we go out and paint by ourselves, but most of us paint in the same place every day, and it is a ball. So anyway, that's one of the things that happened. And then I had, um, oh, what else do I have? I had four artists in. Uh, for a little, just a little private time there. Um, we, we did some boat rides. We did some painting. We had dinner together and, and we just talked about art. We had a whole lot of fun. Um, the guests I had were TM Nicholas, John McDonald, uh, uh, Judd Brown, and George Van Hook. So it was a lot of fun. We just painted for about four days. And then uh, I went back to Austin, Texas, and I hosted Plan Air or Pastel Live, where we had a huge number of people worldwide on Pastel Live, so it was a lot of fun. So, uh, and then I've painted a fair amount too. Um, I had uh, I, I, a lot of painting from my boat. I've got this little wooden boat that I paint in, and uh, it's a lot of fun because I can get into little tight spaces, throw my anchor out, and do a little painting, and it's it's just a lot of fun. I also am trying this summer to paint bigger. I decided not to paint little paintings anymore. And I did a big one, like a 40 inch painting. And I, it was a commission and I have to deliver it by boat. So it was kind of crazy to kind of get that big painting delivered by boat, but we managed to get it done anyway. All right, so uh, what else is going on? Mid-September, I'm gonna be taking a group of painters to New Zealand and that's gonna be fun. And then we have Fall Color Week uh, which is sold out, but we'll have 100 painters in Maine, and it's going to be a lot of fun. We get together and we paint every day, kind of like the Adirondacks, except there's fall color and usually a little breezier, a little cooler, but not always. And this year in Maine is just going to be spectacular. There's so much to paint, so many subject matters, and uh, we are thrilled to do it. Well, we're also thrilled that this podcast is now on audio and video, and it has over 1.7 million downloads. Just hard to imagine. You know, when, a, when I first started the Plein Air podcast, somebody said, well, you know, why bother? I mean, there's not that many Plein Air painters. Wrong. <laughs> anyway, we're being heard in over 90 countries, and uh, or people have picked up and listened from 90 countries, and it has been rated number one in Feedspot's top 15 painting podcast list. We're really happy about that. Um, today's interview, um, when we're done, we have the Art Marketing Minute. And I always like to touch on some art marketing, which I teach at the Plein Air Convention. Now, 
uh, a couple of things, a little housekeeping. First off, the plein air convention is coming up. If you're looking to connect with the plein air community, become part of it or learn more about it, uh, we have the best people teaching uh, and we gather, we're going to have about 1,000 to 1,200 outdoor painters gathered at the Plein Air Convention and Expo in Denver this coming May. You're going to learn techniques from five stages. We gather with friends. We, we have a, a big expo hall with a lot of materials. We paint together. It's uh, uh, in Colorado, May 21 through 25, with a pre-convention workshop with Laurie, oh, Laurie Putnam. <laughs> I almost said the wrong name. And... Uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. There's also going to be an online streaming package if you can't attend. We have 80 instructors so far, including the great C.W. Mundy, Alvaro Castanet, one of the great watercolor artists of our time, Daniel Sprick, Susie Baker, um, and of course our guest today, Jill Wagner, is going to be there and many, many more. So you can learn more about it at theplenairconvention.com. Also, coming up in November, uh, there are lots of styles of art that are you know, that are realistic. You know, there, there are, for instance, um, there's uh, photo realistic, there's academic realistic, there's impressionistic, which is realistic. Anything that you can tell what it is, is realistic. Uh, if you can't tell what it is, then that goes into a whole different area. And so uh, we're going to be teaching uh, on Realism Live almost all the styles of realism. So from tight academic to uh, loose impressionistic, it's November 10 through 12 online. Uh, we have uh, all mediums, oil, watercolor, pastel, et cetera. We have uh, lots of subjects like figure, portrait, still life, landscape, floral, and more. It's the 10th through 12th of November with a beginner's day on the 9th. You can watch online. Some of the faculty, I'm not going to mention them all here, but uh, Juliet Aristides is going to be there. Clyde Aspivig, who is probably, I think it's safe to say, is the finest landscape painter in the world. And uh, very, very rare to get him to do something like this. And so we're very lucky. Uh, Michelle Dunaway, uh, Lisa Egley, Rose Franson, uh, Chuck Morris, Daniel Graves, Alex Kelly, Michael Mettler, Ned Mueller, Carol Peebles, John Potoshnik, Tony Pro, Sarah Sedwick, Leona, and Alexander Shanks from the great studio in Caminati. Um, did I mention Daniel Graves from Florence Academy? Terry Strickland, Dustin Van Weckel, uh, who is a great... Uh, 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 what am I going to say? Wildlife artist, uh, Glenn Blippu, Todd Casey, and many, many more to be announced. And so we're really excited about that. Learn more at Realism Live. I probably, I'm sure I forgot a lot of people. And uh, last but not least, I just want to mention, you know, at the top of the show, I mentioned that the uh, Plen Air magazine has a new design. And, uh, you know, we have subscribers who are collectors and subscribers who are artists. And, and the people who follow the plein air movement, who like to go to watch, to buy, they subscribe. The people who are participating subscribe. It's rooted in deep history. Uh, each uh, bi-monthly issue chronicles master artists, their techniques, demonstrations, plein air events, the collectors who follow them, historic artists, and more. And we have a brand new redesign. And if you get the digital edition, uh, you get 30% more content. Uh, so you should subscribe if you haven't done that. Well, I don't want to say you should. I would love for you to. And I think you'd get a lot out of it. Anyway, visit plenairmagazine.com. Okay, now it's time to get through. We've got through all of our business. It's time to get to our guest, Jill Stephanie Wagner. Jill, welcome to the Plen Air Podcast. Hi, Eric, and happy belated birthday. Oh, well, thank you. And we have, uh, we have a lot going on. It's, it's been crazy. I would imagine your summer's been equally crazy. You mentioned off camera that you were doing a lot of plein air events. Yeah, every year I say I'm going to slow down and do less of them, but I, I love doing plein air festivals. So um, I think I did five already and I've got two more planned um, and some events that aren't really festivals, but I go and paint with people and um, it was, it's what makes my heart sing. I love it. Well, what, what, what events did you do this year? What event is new? What, what events did you do this year? Um, I did uh, paint with Kiva in Florida and also Lighthouse in Florida. Um, uh, I did Door County for the first time. Um, I took July off, but Door County and then uh, Paint Grand Traverse. Um, and I'll be 
going down to Ohio for the Ohio plein air uh, society's event. And then I'm going to Dubuque in October for um, brushstrokes. So there are a lot of people who are listening to this who are kind of new to the whole plein air world and, and what's going on. Uh, would you explain for their benefit what a typical plein air event is like? Sure. Um, most of the plein air events you have to apply to, and maybe there's 100 or 200 artists who apply and usually around 35, maybe 40 artists are accepted. Um, and when the date comes to go, you go to the um, location where you're hosted by um, a very nice family. This is for the higher level ones. A lot of the smaller local ones don't have hosts, but you learn about the rules for that event because every single event has different rules. Um, and you're given the parameters of where you can paint and where you should paint. They often have you show up at certain locations and you just paint with your friends all weekend. Uh, all week, sorry. Um, usually nonstop. I'm I'm out of my bed and out on the scene about seven o'clock every morning, and sometimes <coughs> paint nocturnes up till ten, eleven, one o'clock in the morning, and then you go to bed and you just do it all over again for about five or six days. Um, there's often little events on the side like auctions or small work shows, but there's always a gala at the end. Um, where people pay to um, come and see all the paintings. They're, they're people who live in that community and are really interested in having paintings of their own hometown, the, their hills, the vineyards, the lakes, um, and they come and buy. And often there's a public viewing after that and sometimes um, a online viewing. Um, and then we all pack up, go home, and go see each other at another event. Well, I think it's interesting to see what that, that whole experience is like because, uh, you know, at, if you show up at a plein air event, and, and of course, when we started Plein Air Magazine, there were very, very few, maybe two or three. Now, 20 years later, there's three or four, 350 of them. You know, every, every town's got one, every small town's got one. Um, and it's changed considerably, um, but, it's a tremendous amount of work to get ready to go to one of these. That's a lot of uh, a lot of stress. Talk to me a little bit about the preparation aspect. Of this. Well, it usually takes me about two weeks or so to get ready, and I'm super lucky because I have a wonderful studio assistant and friend, Tina Tia. I'm sorry. Who? Um, By the way, happy helped. birthday, Tia! <laughs> Thank you. And she helps. Um, get me packed up and organized and I, I work in both pastel and oil so that necessitates um, either putting glass in frames or taking glass out of frames depending on which um, medium I'm painting in um, and I, I have a list that I've already typed up for either medium and um, I don't have to keep remembering every time what I what I forget <laughs> um, so I get that all packed up and Tia helps me pack it in the car, and I head off. So you um, got you have to have you have to buy frames or make frames for for the event. You have to have enough panels, yeah. uh, and most events stamp the panels on the back, right? That you painted. Yeah, every <clears throat> every plein air festival will stamp on the back to prove that you painted this it, during the festival, and at some other time. So, yeah, I always bring way too many. When I go in for stamping, I've got 35, 40 panels. And they look at me like I'm a crazy woman. But you never know what size you want, what format. So you have to bring everything. It's like kind of bringing all your clothes when you go on a two-day trip. Well, if you can take your car, you're, you're in good shape. But, you know, yeah. once in a while, somebody's flying to an event like this. And it's a lot of work to, to pack all that stuff up, take it yeah. along. I only go as far as I can drive in my SUV studio. So, you know, 10 hours from my house, unless I'm going to Pace, and then I fly to Pace. <laughs> yeah. Now, Pace being the plein air convention and expert. Yeah. So, uh, Jill, you mentioned that you uh, paint in pastel and in oil at plein air events. What is the 
process of deciding what you're going to use? Is there a time when you're more likely to use oil and a time you're more likely to use pastel? Well, <clears throat> for events that I've already been to and painted in pastel, I usually come back and paint in pastel. Um, I'm really starting to paint more in oil plein air. So uh, my next two events, I'm definitely um, going to be painting in oil. Um, you know, they, they each have their drawbacks. You, you have wet paint you have to deal with when you turn in oil paintings, but pastel, you have to have glass under them. Um, so there's, it, it, there's issues about both of them, but for me, um, I'm, I'm moving more and more toward working in oil um, for plein air. And in the studio, you're working primarily in what? Uh, both. I go back oh. and forth. I told you before, I get mad at one and move to the other. <laughs> you know, I'm doing a, a series of large um, paintings of river stones, which are like four feet by two or three feet. Um, and those are all in oil. But I previously did a series in pastel of those about 10 years ago. So. Well, I have fallen in love with pastel. I, I have to admit, I think I can say this publicly, that I never, I, I always loved and appreciated pastel, but I never gave it consideration for myself. Because, I, you know, it's hard enough to learn one medium, let alone yes. one. But uh, when we were forced in the pandemic to come up with something to replace the plein air convention, we launched Pastel Live and Watercolor Live and others. And... Uh, so I felt obligated that if I was going to ask other people to attend, I needed to not only attend, but I needed to learn those mediums. And I've just absolutely fallen in love with them, uh, both of them. But uh, what I love about pastel is that, you know, first off, there's a, there's an immediacy to it, right? So sometimes if I haven't painted for a while, I go out to my studio and my, my paints are all dry and I have to put new paints out. Whereas with pastel, I can just grab put up a panel, grab a pastel stick and start start yeah. painting, which I love. The, kind of the other thing, you what? That's kind of why I started in it. I, would, I was working still and I couldn't lay out a whole bunch of oil paints and then come back three weeks later and pick up. But with pastel, you could. You could come back five minutes later or five years later um, without any break in your continuum. And, and I also fell in love with the you know, the effects I could get with pastel, I couldn't get with oil and, and the brilliancy of color. I mean, because of the pure pigmentation and nothing in between, I found that to be very helpful. It, it's an amazing medium and, and you apply it very similar to oil, usually first dark and then build to the lights, which is the same way you do in, in oil painting. I'm curious, you know, the people in the watercolor world oftentimes will say that they feel like um, almost like second-class citizens. And, and you know, I, I know artists who say that, that something like watercolor is a master's medium because it's not as easy to learn and master in some ways to get really, really good at it. Yet um, some of them say, well, the galleries don't appreciate it as much or won't carry it. <clears throat> Has that been the case with pastel as well? Well, I think for years, both watercolor and pastel were thought of as less than because they were on paper. You know, just like prints are thought of less than canvas paintings. Um, but with, the, with a lot of the new improvements with both watercolor and pastel, some of those things should fall away. Like uh, watercolors now don't even, a lot of them, at least in the plein air circuit, don't put glass over their paintings. They either wax them or put layers of varnish. Um, and with pastel, we, most of us don't use mats anymore. Mats were a, um, a detriment because no matter what you do, a little tiny bit of that dust is going to fall off the painting and it would get on the mats. And not only that, once we, we use museum glass and a plein air frame, most of the time you can't tell that they're not oil paintings. Um, so they, the perceived value go, has gone up. And pastel and watercolor are very prevalent now in the plein air um, festivals that I've been at. Very much so, yeah. Well, I, th I think that's encouragement for people who are willing to, or wanting to try it and, and learn about it because a lot of those um, 
second class citizen feelings have gone away. And, and, you know, we've really worked hard and I know IAPS has worked hard to try and make sure that that uh, pastel is more accepted. And, uh, and and I think it's working. Yeah, I think so too, slowly but surely. <laughs> so how long have you done this plein air uh, painting thing? Well, um, I owned an advertising agency that I sold uh, 11 years ago. And I had tried some plein air painting back in those times, but I didn't know a whole bunch about it until I went on a trip to Wisconsin to visit a friend. And I didn't know about plein air festivals, but I ran into Door County plein air festival when I was up there. And I saw all these amazing artists painting everywhere and people following them and galas and auctions and being outside and with your friends. And it changed my life. I decided that's what I wanted to do. They're like the movie stars. By going to that Door County event. And unbelievably, this year, I got invited. I never thought I'd get invited. It was going to be on my bucket list for the rest of my life. Um, but I got invited, and I went, and it was amazing. It was like a culmination of a dream. Um, so it's been, it's been 10 years pretty much exactly for me since I started. So what, I, would you, what would you give advice to people who... Uh, are considering, you know, e either going outdoors and painting for the first time or considering, you know, trying to figure it out so that they can turn it into a career or a lifestyle. What, um, what are the things that you did that you made lots of mistakes with? And if in hindsight, if you now knowing what you know now, you could prevent others from having to go through all that. Um, I, you know, I went to art school but at the time I went, there was no traditional instruction for painting. It was pretty much throwing paint at canvases or painting what you feel or happenings. Um, and I felt like I had a real um, dearth of information. So one of the things I did was to try going out painting immediately by myself. And it, it was difficult. I, I had to figure out it, every step on my own, make 50 mistakes and then find the right way to do it. But I started taking workshops and every workshop would give me five or six new ideas on how I could make this process easier and what are the best ways to start a painting? Um, you know, how do I take all this stuff with me? Um, and it's so worth it to learn from somebody who has done that um, because it cuts your time down, the time that, that you waste just doing things that do not work. Um, so I'd, I'd say that first of all. Um, and then I'm, I think um, everybody knows uh, Kevin McPherson's quote, you have to paint 500 plein air paintings before you even understand what plein air is. Um, and to go out there once and go, oh, this isn't for me, I can't do this, is ridiculous. Just like, you know, a heart surgeon doesn't try cutting into uh, somebody who's just a nut a heart surgeon tries to cut in somebody's heart and, and can't do it. You you have to you have to pay your dues. You have to do the process. You have to learn, 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 and make a lot of really crummy paintings, um, and be willing to see them as studies that are furthering um, your abilities and and the paintings that you will create in the future. You know we have we have these um, these. Uh, silly ideas in our head about, you know, that we, we should be able to just sit down and draw perfectly and paint perfectly. And, and those ideas come from, I don't know where, because it's not true in any other profession, right? You know, you know, right. you don't become a brain surgeon. People say all the time, it must be so nice to be talented. And I said, you know, it's 10,000 hours, just like it is for anybody who gets better at anything, any career, any um, any job or passion that you have. And it's basically the, the feeling that you, you can't do without it. You have to paint. You have this passion and you're willing to make all these crummy paintings because you know that it will move you toward a, a better... So you did, you did crummy paintings? Oh my God. I, do cr I have a pile of paintings on my counter over there that I brought back from festivals or done on my own. Some of them I try and resuscitate. 
most of them I have Tia Pain over <laughs> so that nobody will ever find them <laughs> because there is no fixing them. But I learn from each one. I learn what not to do probably more than I learn what. You know, that's a, that's a fear. I, I went to an art, uh, to an artist studio in San Francisco one time when I was relatively new at this. And uh, I was fascinated by being in his studio. And I said, can I look through all these paintings that are here in the shelf? He says, well, those are all rejects. So I'd rather you didn't look at them. I said, well, can I at least look at them? And he said, well, you can look at them. And, uh, and, and the, to me, they were all really good because my eye was untrained at the time. And he said, you know, my biggest fear is I'm going to drop dead and somebody's going to see that those were in my studio and they're going to put them up for sale and ruin my reputation. <laughs> exactly. And, and what we think is good changes constantly. So I, I have kept some of my older versions that I was really pleased with at the time to remind me where I was. Um, but I'm, I'm, fearful of the same thing. I'd rather get rid of them or paint over them or in Pastel's case, wash over them and, and rework them. So what does that mean? Wash over them? You just wash them? Uh, the well, you can, you can wash down the pastel. That's you, first you brush it all off outside with a mask on um, and then rinse them. If it's on board, um, rinse some more of it off. And then you have an undertoned, you know, like a grayish color or. Oh, nice. Or I had no idea. Yeah, to reuse the paper, because pa a pastel on board costs a little bit more than um, pastel paper. Um, I'm luckily sponsored by a pastel paper company, so they they give me lots of wonderful paper. <laughs> uh, you want to mention who they are, since you you are you are pastel paper. Um, they're one oh, of the big providers in the pastel industry, and they have wonderful paper. Awesome. Okay, so um, do, you, do you ever uh, take trips just on your own, you know, go to exotic places or interesting places just to paint? Do you, is that part of your, your journey or do you kind of stick close to home? What's, what's that look like for you? Well, I, I paint the Midwest a lot, but the place I love to go the most is Italy. I've, um, I'm half Italian and I've been there 12 times. But when the pandemic hit, I haven't been back for a while. I, I was in Spain right before then with um, one of my girlfriends who's a teacher. And we painted there for two weeks. But we used to go to Umbria um, and paint at La Romita and teach. And two weeks just roaming the countryside anywhere we wanted to go. And as I've gotten older, I keep thinking, oh, I should go to other places. I mean, I've, I've been to a lot of countries, but I really don't want to go anywhere but Italy anymore. And I think it's, it's, I think it's a biological thing. When I get there, I feel like I'm home in some kind of weird way that I can't explain. Um, I can... You feel, you feel grounded. Get, You're like in tune with the, with the vibe. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's where my family came from. My grandparents came from there and um, all my extended family was Italian and it just feels right. So yeah. I guess that's being a little myopic, but it flips my switch. <laughs> well, I think that's fine. That's, that's, a, that's a good good, good thing. I mean, nothing wrong with going to Italy. I wouldn't mind going there 12 times. I think it'd be fabulous. <laughs> One of my favorite moments is I went over to, to the Florence Academy to speak at their opening for, and I had to be there for three nights. And I had all day free for three days and I rented a car and I just went out throughout Tuscany and painted it was glorious I didn't have anybody to tell me not to do it didn't have anybody to tell me to be home at a certain time not that uh, anybody does that <laughs> <laughs> well that's Tuscany is my favorite place my family was from northern Tuscany um, and I've stayed at a bunch of different auto uh, old farms in that area and it's just gorgeous uh, in a way so, I, I want to probe a little bit about your past uh, because I think I think there are lessons to be learned from this. You you made your living in the advertising world. You owned and operated an advertising agency. Um, tell me how that has served you as a painter. 
Well, um, first of all, it made it possible for me to later become a painter. <laughs> um, it brought in a really good income. Um, but I think even more than that, it taught me to be what I call buttoned up. Um, I, my agency was a mid-sized agency. We worked with big national clients and, and local clients as well. But we had to be on top of our game. There was no uh, saying, oh, I forgot or you know, not show up with the proper materials or not get the job done in time. They're just, that wasn't an option if we wanted to stay in business. And the more employees I hired, the more important that became. Um, so that um, professionalism um, carried me or, or went with me when I became a, a professional artist. I immediately set up a database um, for every painting I created with all the information you could want about each painting. Where is it now? Who bought it? What size is it? You know, what what medium? You know, probably 50 different things about each painting because I knew how important it was to be organized. And I had no idea at the time that I would be painting as many paintings as I do. And it's been a lifesaver. Um, I, I have at my fingers easy access to where every painting is, how much it costs, all that kind of stuff. The minute somebody calls about something. Um, and I also learned that my partners in advertising were as important to me as So my printers, my um, writers, my illustrators, they were part of our team, even if they weren't in my studio. And I would never screw, screw with them. <laughs> I would never, ever do anything to hurt my relationship with them, just as I would never do that to my clients. Um, and well, you know, you, you mentioned that. I'll just I'll just mention an instance or two. Uh, there, there are, and I won't get into names because I wouldn't do that to anybody. But there are people who are developing reputations um, as painters at events, and those reputations are either positive or negative. And uh, there are people who are so buttoned up and so professional that they get asked back. They, they, uh, you know, they're a delight to work with. They, you know, they never miss the deadlines. They do everything they're supposed to do. And then there are people who try to game the system who never do get asked back. You know, people who exactly. I've, heard, I've heard stories of people who, um, you know, take a picture, go to their hotel room and paint the painting from a picture in their hotel room. I've heard stories of people who, that <laughs> It happens a lot. Bad because I'm a good girl. It happens a lot. Yeah, I you know I don't see anything wrong with touching up a painting because I mean there you know there are purists out there who say look you know a plenary painting has to be completed 100 percent outdoors. I was with um, some people who visited me this summer, some painters, and they're like, oh, I see a couple things that I need to do to make it a better painting, and so they would you know they'd work on it a little bit. And, and it, it made it a better painting. So I don't see the issue with that. Well, I, if you're in a plein air festival that says you may not use photography to, to paint your painting, then that's the rule. And I adhere to that. Otherwise, I, at home and um, in events that do allow you to touch up, I definitely do that. Um, but my feeling is you only have one reputation. And once you lose it, it's gone forever. Um, so I, I try and live within the rules of whatever industry I'm in. I'm, I'm happy I got out of advertising with my <laughs> reputation because that can be a really nasty <laughs> um, industry to be in. But um, I, I found oh, on the whole that I have not met any jerks uh, on the plein air um, festival route that yeah. I've been very, I think it's self-selecting in a way. Um, people who want to be outdoors and want to be with their friends and, um, you know, just enjoy what they're doing or tend not to be cranky, ugly. <laughs> right, they're happier people because they love what they're doing. Yeah. I would agree with that. Well, and I think what's happened too is that, you know, because events have been going on for a few years now, what tends to happen, first off, the all the artists talk to each other, all the organizers talk to each other. And if somebody violates the rules, 
you know, word travels fast and all of a sudden those people disappear from the circuit. Yeah. So, um, you know, there's a few that get, get in there once in a while, but uh, it's just no need to break rules. I mean, half of the challenge and half of the fun is being able to, to live up to those rules and, and to, you know, say, hey, I'm not going to use a photograph for that. Yeah. So I think it's good. So you had, uh, I, I would go back to your advertising background for just a second. You had uh, national clients meeting big brands that were nationally known that were advertising on national media, television, radio, whatever. Um, you learned a lot about marketing and what works and what doesn't work. Uh, what are your thoughts from a standpoint of an artist? What, you know, as you know, I teach marketing to artists and I'm always curious to hear what other people have to say. What, if you had to say, look, here, there are two or three things that you just have to master. Uh, that will help you become a better artist. What do you think those two or three things would be? In, within advertising? Well, within marketing yourself as an artist, uh, well, based on what you've learned in advertising. Well, these days it is a bit different from when I was in advertising, um, but social media, you, you, most artists don't want to deal with it, but I think it's something that, that we all have to deal with on some level. You don't have to be on nonstop. But um, we as artists are more responsible for building our own brand now than we were before social media because the galleries expect us to do it. The, the competitions expect us to do it. The people who buy from me want to see my work online. Um, so even though that's difficult, I think that's a really important thing. Um, I still believe in advertising, um, whether it's print, um, or online, um, and I, I would I would caution artists to know that there's two kinds of advertising. Still, um, one of them is product advertising when you're trying to sell a specific thing, whether it's um, a workshop or a car or a painting or you know milk duds. <laughs> That's product advertising. So your goal in that is to sell what you're. Um, putting in that ad. But the other type of um, advertising is image advertising. And that's really made to, to build your brand. Um, you might show some of your product, you might um, mention it and, and talk great things about it, but your main goal is not to sell so much as it is to lift your presence in the industry that you're selling in. So I consider what I do when I um, place ads in uh, Fine Art Connoisseur or Plein Air Magazine or online um, or some other magazines <laughs> is um, image building advertising. I'm not specifically trying to sell that painting I put on there and sometimes that painting's already sold. I want people, including people who wanna buy my work, gallery owners, um, uh, people who are running exhibitions, those people who are running festivals, plein air festivals, to see me and to know that I have pride in my work and that this is my business. I'm not doing it as a part-time gig. Um, so I'm, I used to tell my clients, you should be putting 20 to 30% of your revenue in advertising. Um, and I, now with social media, which is less expensive, I probably do 20, probably 20%. Well, I, I think the other thing that, that we should caution people about is that um, social media, <laughs> say that again? You can't just put one ad in. You have well, to have reoccurring. Well, I think the idea is a campaign, right? Yeah. Campaign, and especially for image advertising. But with, but with social media, which is a very powerful and very wonderful tool, uh, <clears throat> like all media, it's a tool and you buy media based on who is your audience, who you're trying to reach, what kind of messaging that audience needs to hear. And uh, the tendency with social media is to make it a catch all, just throw everything in there without a strategy. And every artist who's using social media needs to have some kind of a strategy. You know, what is it I'm trying to accomplish? Who is it I'm trying to reach? What are the benefits of something 
like a, let's say a Facebook group, or let's, let's say a LinkedIn group of art collectors, that's a lot narrower, for instance, than just saying, okay, I'm gonna put all my ads on LinkedIn. Uh, if you put it in a narrow group of art collectors, then that's better. But if you could find a narrow group of plein air art collectors, that would be better in that particular case, or maybe even regionally plus plein air. And that's where, you know, having the ability to find audiences that are already clumped together, whether it's on social media, whether it's in, in, in uh, print, uh, whether it's online, the idea is that these people have curated content to create certain audiences and that audience then is an opportunity for you to go after. Yeah, and you have to know who your target market is. A lot of artists don't think about that, but what's the age group? What's the, you know, male, female? What kind so of- how do, you find, how do you find that out in, in the case of your paintings? Well, I can see on Instagram um, who's coming to my um, site by those um, different denominators. Um, but I also know who buys my paintings. Um, and, you know, I know that from as being an advertiser for all these years that women make 89% of all buying um, purchases, yeah. whether it's a car, a house, a dog, <laughs> or a painting. Um, women have a lot of sale, uh, a lot of um, strength in making that final decision. Um, and, and that's been true with a lot of my work. Although I, I, I'd say probably 35 male, um, 65 female. And workshops are very female oriented. So uh, those are different um, target well, markets. You have to go deeper than that too. You know, you, you have, if you look at, let's say you mentioned that you can look at the statistics of who visits your page on Instagram. You know, what if all the people visiting your page were 12 year old males uh, because they, they think you're hot, uh, <laughs> but they're not going to buy anything, you know, so knowing your buyer profile is really important. And, you know, I, I, do you keep track, you know, when you sell a painting or when a gallery sells a painting, do you have some kind of a way that you mark that down? You know, this was a 50 year old female um, in the Midwest, you know, because then you can, you know, if you get that kind of data, then you can kind of target that kind of data. I, I do not have that for my galleries, mostly because they don't like to give you any yeah. of that. Yeah. Um, and I don't write it down for my own purchases. I just, that, that, that's, the, yeah, that, that I have from seeing who's buying my work in person yeah. or online. Yeah. So I prob that probably is something so I should do, but you know what? I, I do so. <laughs> I saw so, so data I paint enough. <laughs> so probably something I won't do. But um, coming from the background I'm I come from, I already have a feel for that. Okay, but, so you talked about you I want to continue this dialogue about things that, that you think artists should do. So understanding who your audience is or who your buyer is, because there's a big difference between a buyer and an audience. Yes. Um, they might be in that audience. A but, buyer you know, is a subset of an audience. <laughs> that's right. What What else do you think are you know two or three key essentials that uh, every artist should consider doing as part of their ongoing effort to sell paintings? I think artists should um, enter national shows, um, and I think you should start at the local level, work up to the state, the regional, and then national. But I think. Um, winning awards or being accepted in national shows is um, a big thing. You know, like the Pastel Society of America, they get 3,000, 4,000 entries and only 180 get in. That says something and it builds your way to becoming either a signature or a master member in whatever medium or um, subject matter uh, you want to be known for. So I think that's really important. And people say that costs money. I, I'd send in and I don't get in. I said, you know, I didn't get in the first 15 times I applied to the Pastel Society of America. And I just kept doing it because you have to somehow break through and you learn what those uh, competitions are expecting by actually 
applying and then seeing who got in. So I, I think that's very helpful. You have to look at that as a marketing cost. Yeah, it is. It's it's part of that. I totally consider that part of my marketing. Well, it also isn't that planting seeds. I mean, you have, uh, you of all people know that sometimes the result of advertising is an immediate, you know, I'll get a call from somebody who says, I bought one ad and I didn't get any phone calls or I didn't sell my painting. And, you know, that people have, sometimes they have skewed expectations. I mean, it takes, there's a process for somebody to learn who you are and, and, you know, and, you know that is so true because uh, it took me forever to get into PSA and then I became a signature member, then a master. And all of a sudden I got a call from the plein air convention and they asked me to come teach. And I'm like, oh my God, why are you picking me? I mean, how did you even know about me? And they said that they saw that I was a master in the Pastel Society of America. So that opened up the whole world of doing things with your company from two videos to, um, Pastel Live to this is going to be my fifth plein air convention. So many articles that I've had in um, your and, and it was because I kept going uh, for the Pastel Society of America to get that um, designation. Well, uh, and from our from our perspective, just on the other side of that, you know, we have we we get people who contact us all the time. You know, they want to be. They want to be on the plein air convention. They want to be on one of our uh, pastel live or plein air live broadcasts. They want to be, uh, they want us to use them for a video. And the questions that we ask, uh, and, and you know, you feel always feel a little bad having to ask these questions, but you know, ultimately you have to find out if somebody is marketable, right? So we knew you were marketable just by the titles that you had received. Uh, and because your name, your brand became known. But, you know, sometimes, you know, you hear from somebody and, and you know, you want to be nice to them, of course. Uh, but you want to say, well, listen, you know, how many people are following you on Instagram and Facebook? And, and how many workshops are you selling out? And uh, yeah. what, what accolades and what awards have you got? And, and, you know, because we have to, you know, if we're putting somebody's name out there, the purpose is to hopefully draw an audience, right? To, to have somebody go, oh, Jill's going to be at the plein air convention. I have to go. And, <laughs> I'm not sure that happens. But, well, I, I, you're very but, you know, That's true. Even on a lower level, I have, you know, uh, students and people that um, I teach who ask me, they want, they say, I want to get on the circuit, the plein air circuit. And I say, how many paintings do you paint in a week? And they say, well, I paint one painting a month. And I said, well, I paint five paintings a day or three paintings a day at these plein air conventions. And, you know, they come to my workshops and they can't make it past noon because they get tired. And, and that's all OK, but you can't expect a different um, result from not putting, you know, the work in. You can't expect to, you know, have Easton call you when you do one painting a month. Um, and no, everybody doesn't have to be a professional artist. Hobby artist is wonderful. Paint just because you love it is wonderful. But there's distinctions um, between those two categories. Um, and it's hard work. That's what the distinction is. It's, it's well, hard it does take hard work. And it, and it kind of goes back to that first point you made. And that is, you know, you're, you know, have, being buttoned down, as you say, having your act together and <laughs> Showing up and that's having this my husband. There. <laughs> and, and one thing feeds another. You know, if you, you mentioned, you know, Plein Air Easton, you know, Plein Air Easton will look and see if somebody's been featured in Plein Air Magazine, or Plein Air Magazine will look and see if somebody's been at Plein Air Easton or Plein Air Door yeah, County, or, you know, you so. Have to play the game. And so uh, it, artists sometimes feel like I don't want to be in an industry, but you are in an industry. And um, there's certain steps that are important to um, improve your chances. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Jill, I, I want to uh, make sure that we give you a little coverage for some of the things that you're doing. You have a workshop coming up this fall in Toledo, Ohio. Is that right? Yep. I, I usually only do one or two, sometimes three workshops a year um, so that I can con you know concentrate on painting, but I'm doing... Um, a pastel workshop there um, September 9th and 10th, I think. I think it's 
it may be sold out. There may be one or two places left. Um, but yeah, I, I love teaching. I really enjoy it. Uh, I, always, I just get a kick out of it. Um, I and just how, how do we follow you? We're, you're on Instagram and Facebook at what? Um, um, Jill Wagner Art is Instagram. Um, JillWagnerArt.com is my website. And Jill S. Wagner, Jill.S.Wagner um, is Facebook. All right, terrific. Well, uh, we, we've had a lot of fun having you on the podcast. And, you know, you're so smart. We've learned a lot from you. I, I think what I, I'm going to do is retire and let you take over our marketing boot camp at the convention. <laughs> oh, no. Because you're doing such a great job. I walked away from that place and I never looked back. <laughs> I thought I thought it was going to be difficult, mm -mm. <laughs> I, but I still do marketing. It's just my own marketing. <laughs> yeah, I've been there, done that. I've walked away from a couple of things myself that I never look back and feel pretty good about. But yeah, you know, I would tell everybody do what scares you most. Oh, what great advice! Um, I, every step of the way through my life, I was scared to death. You know, I can't go to big. University of Michigan, and uh, oh, I can't work in advertising. I can't have my own agency. There's no way I can do that. You know, everything was, I was absolutely terrified. I'd say, hey, no, no, not going to happen. And then I'd slowly work myself into, well, maybe, and okay, I can do that. Um, so can you say, if you, can, now. I, if, you, if you can't say, I understand, but can you say who your biggest national client was? Well, I had I worked for Denny's. I worked for GM. Um, I, I didn't do their whole accounts. They they uh, they would give us jobs. Um, I I almost every part of the University of Michigan, um, from the health center to all the separate departments, the law school. Um, we did a lot of high tech. Uh, pro so how do you get the guts to? say, you know what, I'm good enough to go call a GM. You want me to tell you a story? Yeah. <laughs> I had a friend who was an engineer at um, uh, Hydromatic, which made transmissions. And he, they needed to have an ad for Transmission Digest history, um, magazine. And um, th they needed a whole campaign. And he called me in. And I was sitting in front of, this was in the late 80s in front of all these men who couldn't believe that I owned a woman owned agency could possibly do transmission digest stuff. You don't even know about transmission. I said, I, I learned about all my products, but I know about marketing. I don't know about, you know, heart surgery either, <laughs> but we can still advertise it. So we ended up getting the job and I asked to take my team through the mile long factory in G at GM and ask questions about everything. How would the transmission made? Who's this going to? All this kind of stuff. And all the way down that mile, this is in the early 80s. Women didn't have their own advertising agencies. The cat calls oh, no. from the guys on the line were so obscene. I And we were in long skirts. We were not. <laughs> <laughs> did not look like prima donnas out there. And not one of those men who accompanied us, the executives, ever told guys to shut up. The, we walked a whole mile of that. Oh. Um, so it was difficult being a woman-owned agency at that time. Uh, just perceived, our perceived value, just like watercolor and pastels was not as high as males. Um, and they didn't think anything of... Uh, I'm treating you poorly. <laughs> so I, really, I did, but I love it. The, really the good part about though. it, the good part about it was we created the highest rated ad campaign in transmission digest history, which started in 1898. Wow. Because I was so <laughs> mad. <laughs> was like, I'm going to prove these guys wrong. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then um, we did, we had that for like three or four years. Well, we've had a real big change in, in the in the art world, even since I've been doing it for the last 20. And that is that, you know, it's been a very male dominated society, but that's really changing a lot. And we're now getting to the point where they're, you know, part of 
becoming a master has nothing to do with gender. It has to do with time, you know, like you said, the 10,000 hours. Now what's happening is there's been enough people who have been doing this for long enough that we're starting to see levels of mastery in all genders. And that's a big deal. Yep. It's amazing. I'm, I think women are still on the, the back end of that just because they've usually been the caregivers for the years. You right, know, the and years. they haven't had the time to develop. Yeah, and, and well, I'd like to tell people that I started late. You know, it's, I've only been painting for 10 years, really. Um, you can do it. <laughs> well, you're an inspiration, Jill, and thank you so much for being on the Plein Air Podcast. We're really happy to have you here. And, you know, you're so good at this. We could probably carry on for another couple of hours. But, uh, I tend don't... to run the mouth. <laughs> oh, no, you don't run the mouth at all. You, you, if you do, it's very valuable information. So uh, thank, thank you so friend. much for being on. And uh, we'll uh, uh, remind everybody to go to Jill's website, check out her all of her workshops, and, of course, see her at the Plein Air Convention and, and uh, Pastel Live next year and so on. And uh, uh, it's really terrific. Thank you so much. Uh, we also should mention that Jill has a brand new uh, pastel painting video uh, from Streamline, a paint tube, and uh, it's called Pastel Painting from photos, this five-step process. Uh, because if you're gonna paint from photos, you wanna make it look real. And Jill has figured out how to master that and how to teach that to you. So this is a fabulous video. And you can get that at painttube.tv, pastel painting from photos, a five-step process. Jill, thank you so much. Thanks, and, Eric. Uh, we will see you at the Plein Air Convention. You now, will. all right. Um, now, what we're going to do is move on to the Art Marketing Minute. This is the Marketing Minute with Eric Rhodes, author of the number one Amazon bestseller, Make More Money Selling Your Art, Proven Techniques to Turn Your Passion into Profit. We try and uh, answer your art marketing questions. You can send them to me, eric at artmarketing.com. And of course, you can go to artmarketing.com where we have a blog there with lots of art marketing answers and we also have you know books and all kinds of other things so Amadine uh, my producer is going to ask the first question Amadine has a French accent and she's always thinking nobody can understand her but we understand you perfectly Amadine Go for it. <laughs> thank you. you you're too sweet Eric so the first question is from Sandra I started teaching myself to paint with watercolor nine years ago two years ago I started with oils and right now I prefer them I have sold very few of my paintings, and because I'm still very much in the learning phase, my paintings are always evolving. I now have two, over 200 paintings clogging my space and my energy. How should I present my older available work on my website, or should I just build a big bonfire? Well, okay, what a great question. Thank you, Sandra. As, uh, Sandra, uh, we all have... Uh, boxes of paintings that nobody should ever see. Uh, we, we have uh, a learning process and we, we're going to make mistakes. And there are people out there who will look at a painting that you've done that you now look at and say, gee, this painting isn't very good, but they'll look at it and think it's pretty good. And so there, there is possibly a market. The question is, do you knowingly want to put, put your signature on something and put, put it into the market if it is not living up to your current standards? Now, everybody has to answer that question differently. I can't answer it for yourself, for you. I can answer it for myself. And that is, I don't want anything out there that, <clears throat> that represents me badly. Now, there are paintings that I've done in the past. As a matter of fact, I, I visited my gallery one time, one of the three galleries I'm in. And, uh, and I was being given a tour by this, this person who was a gallery assistant. And uh, she took me upstairs and she's pointing out some of my work on the walls. And uh, I, was, I noticed this one painting I had done 10 years earlier. And I cringed when I saw it because I had improved so much. And I was about to say something like, take it off the wall and burn it. And she said, this is my favorite painting in the gallery and I'm making payments on it to, to own it. <laughs> and so I, uh, I really learned a good lesson there. I just keep my mouth shut. But I would, uh, I, I think, you know, if you have paintings that are cluttering and you want to get them out of your life, pick, 
pick a few that represent uh, your your stages of growth and keep them and never throw them away. The rest of them, you know, uh, donate them to a charity or a charity auction or or give them to somebody. Or, you know, you may just decide that you want to do a bonfire. And many people do that uh, because you want to make sure that your signature is representing what, you know, what you believe uh, is your best work. Now, I even, I change from year to year, right? So one year later, when I come up to my place at the lake and I look at all the paintings I did a year ago, I cringe sometimes, but, you know, they're easily fixable because it's not that big of a difference. And so I'll fix them and then I'll sign them and send them off to the gallery and then everything is cool. So I think, you know, the, the most important thing to remember is you asked about your website, edit what you put on your website. Don't put everything on there. You know, imagine if you were going to, uh, let's see, you know, sharperimage.com or something like that. And, and they had a bunch of substandard stuff on there. It's going to impact their image. But if they only have the good stuff on there, then it's going to have a positive effect. So edit, pick, pick the best stuff, put it on your website. And don't put everything on all at once. You know, you don't want to over overwhelm people. I also encourage you to have some of your better paintings on there that have sold with some red dots because that provides what's called social proof. That means social proof means other people liked it and bought it. That's why it's so effective. If you go into an art show and you start seeing some red dots, it says, oh, I better hurry up and get this done because other people are buying. Uh, you also have friends who would appreciate your painting. So that, that's what I would recommend. What's our next question, Amadine? Next uh, question is from Loretta Sampson. Do you travel and paint along the way and sell your art as you go? Is there a process to selling art as you travel? I will be taking a longer trip, glamping along the way, and plan to paint the scenery as I go. The painting and travel is the easy part. Marketing as we go is hard. I would love some free advice. Thank you. Well, just remember that uh, when you get free advice, you get what you pay for, right? <laughs> I have a lot of artist friends who uh, are what I would consider to be street artists is, and, and they will go on a trip and their intention is to feed themselves along the way by selling art along the way. Uh, I have lots of other friends who go to exotic places to paint and their intention is not to sell the art. It's just to get good studies, good, uh, good experiences, and then bring them back and make other paintings out of them. Uh, you know what? I, I don't even sell my studies typically uh, because I like to hang on to them because they're, they're good references because I don't like to paint from photos all the time. Uh, and so I would, um, you know, I, I, you have to decide what, what's right for you. Uh, there is a method, uh, a method that has worked fairly well. Um, I was standing in, uh, in Banff or Lake Louise and I was painting by this waterfall with Richard Lindenberg and this guy came up to me. And he started asking me questions like, how long did that take you to paint? And, and you know, my typical answer is, well, two hours and 20 years, right? So uh, 20 years of, of learning how to do it in two hours. And then he asked me, you know, uh, how much would I sell the painting for? And I just, my sense was this guy was not going to spend any money. So I just said, you know, I'm, I'm typically, you know, not trying to sell paintings off the easel. I'll, you know, I'll package it up and send it to a gallery later and, you know, he, he, I said, but if you're, you know, if you're interested, make me an offer. And, and he says, well, I would, I would um, give you 50 bucks for that. <laughs> and, you know, to him, I mean, I'm sure he meant well, and 50 bucks was probably a lot of money to him. And, and I declined because I, I wanted to keep it. Uh, but what I do now, which is very effective, is, is oftentimes the people who they, they come up to you when you're painting, they'll say, do you sell your paintings? That's what's called a buying signal. And it, it's not necessarily a buying signal that they have money or not, but um, sometimes you can tell based on the level of questions they ask or you know, them saying they have a lot of other paintings, that kind of a thing. But I usually say this, I say um, in kind of in this order, you know, uh, I'm a professional. I make part of my living as a professional artist and my paintings sell for what some people think is a lot of money. Other people don't think so. Um, now that's now I've established that I'm a professional and that my paintings sell for a, a fair amount of money. Then I say, uh, now my plan is to finish this painting here in the next 20 minutes or two hours or whatever, 
I'm going to then take it back, touch it up, frame it, and send it off to my art gallery who represents me. Or I'll say one of the three art galleries that represents me. Then it says, okay, I'm in a gallery, I'm credible, I'm making my living. Then I'll say, uh, this painting in my gallery, uh, with their markup and with the cost of a frame, this painting would probably sell for $4,000, for instance, or $2,000, whatever the number is. And then I say, if I if I decide I'm going to sell it from the easel while it's wet after I finish it, then I would charge what the gallery would pay me, which is, you know, let's say it's a thousand dollars. Since I don't have a frame with me, I, that knocks off a couple, you know, fifty, hundred more bucks or whatever, which means I'll sell it for nine hundred dollars. And uh, you know, that may be too much. I understand that, uh, but that's what I need to have. If you're interested, come back uh, within the next. X, Y, Z time. And most people will kind of go away at that point because they don't want to spend the money. Now, if you sense that there's there's interest, I'll say something like this. If you think you might be interested later, uh, before I go, get back to me before I go, I'll be here for at least another hour. If somebody else doesn't buy it first, uh, let's take a picture of it uh, with your camera. And uh, or uh, what I oftentimes will do is say, let's take a picture of you and me with it with my camera and then I will say, I'll text it to you, what's your phone number? And they'll text it and I'll put their name in it. Now I've got their name and I can follow up, you know, a few days later and say, hey, Charlie, uh, we met out by the waterfall and do you have uh, any interest in this painting? Here's a picture of it. And then I oftentimes say, you know, if you're interested, I, you know, I accept cash. If we don't have cash, I have a way I can take credit cards even out here, but there's no obligation. I've sold many, many, many paintings from the easel by following that process, uh, but most people are onlookers and most people aren't used to paying the kind of prices they would pay in a gallery. Uh, and we'll say they'll, they'll spend 50 bucks on it. And once in a while, if I sense somebody just loves it so much and, they, and I just sense they don't have the money, sometimes I'll just give it to them. And sometimes I'll say, hey, I'll take 50 bucks for it. And, and I would normally sell this for a thousand bucks, but I like you and I know you like it and I'd love for you to have it. And, and that's just because I want to be generous with people sometimes. But that's a, cho a choice that you have to make. Anyway, traveling and painting can go well together. But most important is just don't put yourself under pressure to sell unless that's critical to pay for your trip. If you want to do that, then you're going to have to do that. But you'll have to be a little bit more aggressive to do that. Anyway, that's today's Art Marketing Minute. This has been the Marketing Minute with Eric Rhodes. You can learn more at artmarketing.com. Remind you guys that we're going to meet at the Plain Air Convention of Colorado in May. And if you can't do it, there is an online version. But of course, that's only the main stage. And you want to get all of the stages. There's four or five stages. There's an expo hall. We're painting outdoors together. It's a blast. Just go to plainairconvention.com. Also, uh, join me in November for Realism Live. Uh, lots of the world's top artists teaching various forms of realism and impressionism. And uh, just go to realismlive.com. Last but not least, uh, the brand new redesigned Plein Air magazine is out. And you would love it, I think. And, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of people that are listening to this who aren't yet subscribers. And you, you really would love it. Uh, it'll really feed that, you know, that plein air desire. And the, if you're out of the country, out of the U.S., uh, Plein Air Magazine Digital Edition has actually 30% more content, more images and so on. And that way you get it delivered. Most people actually buy the print magazine so they can keep it, flip it, hold it in their hands. And they also have the digital so they get the extra content. But they also that way they always have it on their iPad so that they can, uh, you know, look at it on an airplane or on a car trip or something like that. Anyway, uh, anyway, that's about all we got for today. If you've not seen my blog where I talk about my thoughts about life and other things, not so much about art, check it out. It's called Sunday Coffee, and you can find it at coffeewitheric.com every Sunday. Also, I'm on the air daily on Facebook and YouTube. My show is called Art School Live, where hundreds of artists do demonstrations and talks. I'm on noon Eastern every weekday, and you can go to YouTube and subscribe by searching Art School Live or Eric Rhodes or even Streamline Art. Hit that button and subscribe and hit that little bell button too, and that notifies you when we go live. Uh, and please follow me on Instagram at Eric Rhodes and Facebook at Eric Rhodes. I'm 
Eric Rhodes. Figure that out. Huh? Publisher, founder of Plein Air Magazine. Thank you again for your time today. And thanks again to Jill Stephanie Wagner. What a rock star she is. We are really thrilled to have her on the program today. Remember, it's a big world out there. Go paint it. We'll see you. Bye-bye. This has been the Plein Air Podcast with Plein Air Magazine's Eric Rhodes. You can help spread the word about Plein Air painting by sharing this podcast with your friends. And you can leave a review or subscribe on iTunes so it comes to you every week. And you can even reach Eric by email, eric at plenairmagazine.com. Be sure to pick up our free ebook, 240 Plein Air Painting Tips by some of America's top painters. It's free at plenairtips.com. Tune in next week for more great interviews. Thanks for listening.